Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Let, let me start by um, two vignettes which actually illustrate the changes in my science, the life sciences, over the um, more than half century since um, Watson and Crick um, discovered, um, decoded the famous double helical structure of DNA. Um, <laughs> When in 1953 they published the papers um, which um, have become canonical, iconic papers, um, their main understanding and enthusiasm was this is fantastically interesting and exciting science. We will get Nobel Prizes. Roll forward half a century when Jim Watson was then the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, a, a hotshot lab in, um, in cl cl close to New York in molecular biology when a researcher, a colleague of mine, as it happens, went to see him with a new potential discovery, um, Watson's response was not, this is a Nobel Prize. It was, goody, we'll make shed loads of money out of this. And that distinction, the transformation of what was, if you like, a small, exciting science for scientists into this enormous enterprise in which has brought together an industrial academia complex in which many, many bioscientists themselves are simultaneously university professors, CEOs of spin-out companies, shareholders, directors, advisors to government, in bed with the military and so on. This complex is something which has become enormous and very powerful. So the whole nature of doing science has actually changed. And if you like, archetypally, symbolically, of that huge change in the structure of science have been the major projects of the last two or three decades. Um, beginning in the, um, around 1990 with the launch of the Human Genome Project, the project to decode the entire three billion nucleotides, the DNA bases which, cons which constitute the, hu the human genome. And the launch of this, which was supposed to cost $3 billion, started as a public but then became a public-private race to actually sort of decode and to patent the genes. And it was launched with enormous hyperbole. The hyperbole said, um, and this is an editorial by the um, editor of the um, premier US scientific magazine, Science, said that when the genome is decoded, we will be able to have cure, treat and cure not only um, cancer and schizophrenia, but even we will solve the problem of homelessness. So these enormously hyperbolic claims actually uh, as, uh, symbolize the hype and hope that has gone with the development of these big sciences over the last decades. The assumption was that if you actually were able to decode the three billion bases of the DNA, you would actually have, if you like, the telephone directory of life, um, with which you could call up any particular number, read off the DNA, and then read off from that the behavior, the disease, or whatever else it might be that, that went with it. Um, it took 10 years and huge technological speed up to actually sort of decode the human genome. And then, to their embarrassment, the discovery was that there were only 20,000 genes in the genome. It was immediately apparent that the 20,000 genes couldn't do the job of actually creating, assembling the 100 trillion cells in the human body, the 10 trillion synaptic connections between the different regions in the brain. And furthermore, it was not actually going to be able to deliver the health claims that actually came from it. What had happened, the molecular biologist, geneticists, in a sort of um, reductionist molecular arrogance, had actually forgotten the lessons that they ought to have learned from if they'd understood Darwinian evolutionary theory, if they'd understood the whole issue of development and the ways in which an organism assembles itself from the mater raw material which is given in its genes and in its environment during development. By 2001, when the first draft of the genome was published and there was an amazing press conference, a transnational press conference with um, Bill Clinton um, on one side and flanked by the NI National Institute of Health Director um, Francis Collins and Craig Venter. And on this side of the Atlantic there was Tony Blair, 
who wasn't flanked by anyone at all because he was too arrogant to bring John Sulston, who'd done the work in, 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 at the Wellcome Foundation here. But they then said, with huge hyperbole, this is like putting a man on the moon. Indeed, the director of the Wellcome Trust went even further and said, this is an invention comparable to the invention of the wheel, comparable to the discovery of fire. So that's, in a sense, the genomic promise, and the genomic promise which we'll come back to after um, w when we've looked a little bit more at some of the complexities of it and try to explore why it hasn't actually succeeded, what was missing from this account. But at this stage, I think I'd like to pass over to Hillary. Okay. Well, in the middle of those 90s, I mean, scientists are different from many of us in that they think about the present and the future. They don't look back very much. I mean, it's sort of in, their, in the way that they work, the way that they think. So halfway through, they were thinking of the next step. And one of the big parts of the next step, one we all know, was gene therapy. And that didn't work very well, I mean, if at all. Um, very minor changes. So the great hopes of that just didn't happen. But the big thing, where the big money went into, were the DNA biobanks. And they had um, a very straightforward idea. They took the DNA as the genotype, mm -hmm. and they took people's health status as the phenotype. And the idea was if they could bring those two together, they could explain in genetic terms which set of genes cause which disease, and therefore you would be able to make new medicines. The idea is that we will be able to have um, personalized medicine. The simplest example for anybody who's got elevated um, blood pressure are the pills for controlling blood pressure. And basically, there are three classes. And they work differently. And what your GP does is they start with A, that's not working very well, they try B, and all oh, good, C's working. Now, well, the idea is that you will know from the genetic printout which of those classes will work. Difficulty there is if your gene doesn't fit any of them. Um, so the old problem remains. And the thought that you could make a drug that fits the individual, I mean, A, it's commercially non-viable, because you don't have enough people in any given category to make a drug for them. So the idea of personalized medicine had very serious problems from its very beginning. And what companies are always looking for is what they call the blockbuster drugs. What they wanted was populations. And one of the things that they constantly refer to in this is the good population. And it's quite funny because it varies a lot. So I'm going to talk briefly about two. One is. Um, a big study, the UK Biobank of half a million people. And the other one is the study of Iceland. The story that Carrie Stephenson had got the money and was, he was a Harvard professor of neurology <laughs> whose special area of interest was MS. He used to go home, like a lot of Icelanders want to do who are working somewhere else, and carried out his research in Iceland. And there he clearly spotted the potential. He was doing genetic stuff. Spotted the potential of Iceland as, if you like, the ideal place to carry out this study. He saw the commercial possibility. And there was a, a sort of right-wing government at the time with Odson um, as the premier. He was really keen on very light regulation. The deal they cut, and I think that's the right language, um, was that um, Iceland would make available the entire medical records of the entire population without any of them being asked whether they'd like to be involved in research. In return, Stephenson was going to put everything, uh, all the records, onto what we call the elect electronic medical record, the MR, because only when it's um, put into um, computer terms can you actually handle the numbers. He was going to give that data back to the government because it's very useful for managing healthcare more efficiently. So there was that. Also, there was the promise, the usual promise of um, biotechnology, um, better diagnostic tests, better drugs. The doctors understood themselves as having a stewardship relationship, a stewardship. They were responsible for medical records. They were responsible for their privacy. So they were very angry about this. And the um, Stephenson and the government had forgotten that you might need to ask people before you introduce this. Within weeks, there is a colossal row, um, because people should at least have some choice as to whether they um, take part or they don't. What was introduced was something called the opt-out. And you could, if you were very energetic and got the papers, you could decide not to be part. 
So it was tremendous support with very eminent geneticists writing to the prime minister saying, please don't do this, this is a disaster for genetics. The commercial sector thinks it's great. The academics don't much like it, except for the small number who are actually involved in it. Um, the opt-out worked rather well, and it damaged the statistics um, in that there's always a problem in this one. And in a small country, you don't really get enough people with any one disease category to do the mathematics, or it takes you years to get enough people who die of this particular problem. You'll have to keep your DNA biobank going till 30 years, until you've got enough cases. And that sort of thing wasn't really thought through, and you have to have, frankly, a bigger sample. UK Biobank, when Carrie lets out this great news that he's actually doing it, um, UK Biobank was also being planned. And this was planned particularly from Wellcome, who also brought in the MRC. And they've always had a slightly difficult relationship, because Wellcome is the biggest medical charity in the world. I mean, the world is really big. Um, and the MRC, you know, so there was kind of jostling between them. On this one, they came together and made this joint plan for this half million. They were going to get a little fancier. They were going to collect a certain amount of social data as well about people and some simple measurements. With the change in our population, it's now extremely diverse. So the Brits said, our population is much better because of our genetic diversity. But what happened in this one is that the <coughs> difficulty of getting a sample which represented that genetic diversity, that cultural diversity, they couldn't actually achieve it. They only got 10% of the people that they asked to take part. That's an incredibly serious thing. We know the kind of person who will take part. It's your kind of person. Poor people, um, minority people, they don't take part. So we've got, they've now got the bank set up. It's ready to go last year. And this is where the really critical thing comes. It was meant to achieve wealth creation and health creation. Um, for wealth creation, They've so far only had one commercial application to use the bank. They've had two or three, three or four hundred applications from academics. Academics are not really the right people to do wealth creation. They may do, but they're not central. So I would argue in terms of wealth creation, the jury is very much out as to whether it will work. And what they haven't noticed at the same time is they're still working on an intellectual plan, which was developed in the late, 19, late 90s and launched then. And Genomics has moved on at a hell of a speed. So I'll leave the story there. Well, the game of the, um, the intention of the biobanks was to build on the genome, build on the HGP, and to assemble, as Hillary said, um, DNA records for huge numbers of population. You would then extract from these records particular people with particular diseases, and you'd be able to locate the particular genes which characterized the, those people with those diseases. But the project fell foul, not merely of the economic problems which Hillary raised, but the naive biological assumptions they were making for people diagnosed with schizophrenia or with um, bipolar men uh, disorder. There are at least 170 different gene markers which may or may not be associated with these conditions. The geneticists have forgotten that genetics and, li and biology is a great deal more complicated than one gene, one condition, or even two or three genes, two or three different conditions. They had ignored the lessons from evolution, and above all, they'd ignored the lessons from development. And it took the smart ones, um, Craig Venter particularly in the United States, Eric Lander in the States, not long to realize that in fact this was not going to work, that in fact the things were much more complicated. And that's where the the bad hypothesis of the genome has turned into a more creative understanding of life processes in the cells, because it meant going back to two key features of, of, of life science. It meant going back to evolutionary theory, and it meant going back to understanding development. Perhaps a month ago now, a consortium of laboratories published an entire new um, set of sequences called ENCODE, and ENCODE maps not the 2% of the genome which is associated with particular genes, particular coding for particular proteins, but the 98% of the genome, most of which Francis Crick had called, as I said, junk or selfish DNA and wasn't supposed to do anything. 
turns out that's extremely important in the processes of development because it's the way the cell uses the complex of the DNA, which is not the protein coding ones, to organize itself during development to actually say, okay, turn on this gene now, turn on that gene now, turn on this gene in the liver, turn on that gene in the brain, or whatever else it might be. And this is bringing together the sciences of development and, evolution and, and genetics, which got separated sort of the back about um, 1904, 1905, into a new science of life. And that's what people are talking about when they talk about epigenetics. And for me, trained as a life scientist, as a, as a biochemist, and, and, and someone concerned with dynamism and process, epigenetics, development, and putting these two together is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of moving away from this intense molecular focus which has dominated molecular genetics over the course of the whole examples of the genome project. So the telephone directory metaphor failed because actually there wasn't one telephone number associated with one condition. Now there may be 70 or 80 or 100 or 200 different telephone numbers you might have to call up to understand how the whole factory is put together. And we should stop thinking of the DNA like that. If David Cameron wants to continue talking about DNA, uh, family values being in the DNA of the Conservative Party, he is outdated. That's not the way that biologists are now thinking. I think also the other take-home message is this is not going to produce health. No. It's not going to produce wealth. Um, the, co the collapse of the pharmaceutical industry over the last years, pulling out of major areas of mental health research, for example, is an example of what's going wrong there. So it will produce interesting science, but it's not going to do um, what it said on the tin. You know, there's such a sense that you convey so powerfully, such a sense of the ways in which science can be harnessed to exploitative, even oppressive, uh, activities. Um, there's such a sense of, 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 of the, the, the dangers actual and potential in so many of these, these, these lines of research and their applications. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, does, does it make it difficult to actually take pleasure in science, to actually enjoy it in the same way that if you were an artist, presu artist presumably you would take pleasure in, in art? Stephen does, I tell you, he actually even sings, and he's completely tuneless. <laughs> he sings in the lab. I mean, they do still. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, 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 well, I was until I sort of retired from the lab and published my last empirical research paper about learning in chicks about sort of, um, a couple of years ago now. But I was what's called a wet biologist. You know, so you, you actually did things with your own hands. I trained animals. I dissected, I did biochemistry and things that are associated with it. And that is marvelously exciting. To the outsider, um, I suspect, even to, 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 to an outsider who sort of looks on, on, on their neuroscientist sort of bloke coming back from work each day, completely nerd-like activity. <laughs> it's, I, someone once described it as crawling along the frontiers of science with a hand lens. I mean, it is very, very tiny work, but it, it is incredibly exciting. You do an experiment, you, find, you, 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 you make a hypothesis. The second best thing is the hypothesis actually works. Assuming the technology works, of course, you started as a neurobiologist, so you, you all know this. The best thing, um, which is actually an example of, of, from the Genome Project itself, is you have a hypothesis, you do the experiment, and the bloody thing doesn't work, because then you've got to think, and that's really exciting. And, and, and yes, I, I never got bored with that. <laughs>